Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. This is the last evening of the California 48th Congressional Debate Series. And tonight we'll be focusing on two distinct issues, health care and US social justice. So it's a two-parter. We're going to have two moderators today. Um, so the first segment is going to be health care. And we have Anthony Wright from Health Access California, who's going to be moderating. Um, and he will be introduced more soon. Um, and then our own Aaron McCall <laughs> will be moderating the US social justice piece. Um, and so I want to thank our uh, partners tonight. And so that includes Equality California, Health Access California, and our media partners, Laguna Beach Independent and Newport Beach Independent. <clears throat> so a couple of uh, important announcements. You guys should all have a paper straw poll uh, if you walked in. If you don't, um, our volunteers and the lovely fluorescent vests have them for you. Um, make sure that you do fill it out today and you'll see when, when the event is over, there's some boxes at the door. So please leave that. It gives us a good sense of what the sentiment of the room was for the event. Um, and then also uh, another important uh, announcement is that starting tonight at 10 p.m., we are going to have an online endorsement. So this is a nonpartisan. We have uh, most of the candidates, uh, not all of the candidates, and that's because there are some candidates that do not reflect indivisible OC48's values, and you will read all about that in the the uh, panel or the packet that comes with it. But you will have a chance to vote for, uh, I think, nine different candidates or vote from nine candidates. If you are not signed up. If you have not received an email in the last few days about it, um, email info at ioc48.com and we will add you. You will have up until 8 a.m. on the 25th to add yourself to the list and voting closes at noon on the 25th. Okay, So uh, make sure that you, you take part of that. Um, and so then once that, that endorsee is selected, uh, we will be submitting that person to vetting from Indivisible National. So they will get actual national recognition out of this uh, if they pass their vetting process. <clears throat> so, and then I think just checking my list, making sure everything's here. Um, and so that's, that's all my announcements. Um, but I want to introduce Estrella Lucero from Equality California, and she will be opening up um, to talk about health care. Good evening. Thank you so much. Good crowd. <laughs> Um, so, again, good evening. My name is Estrella Lucero. I am a program manager at Equality California. Uh, our tagline, we are the nation's largest statewide LGBTQ civil rights advocacy organization. That's great. Yeah. I also uh, want to make sure, uh, you know, that we all give a collective thank you to Aaron McCall, Indivisible OC48, to make this event possible. Uh, thank you to our fellow co-sponsors, especially Health Access. Shout out to Amy, shout out to Anthony, so thank you. <laughs> so uh, if you have not heard of Equality California, uh, at our organization, we bring the voices of LGBTQ people and our allies to institutions of power and strive to create a world that is healthy, just, and fully equal for all LGBTQ people. Um, and as I'm sure we may know, uh, you know in this room, you know, we're very privileged to live here in California. Uh, the LGBTQ community has fought tirelessly and successfully for the implementation of strong state anti-discrimination laws. But just because we have some protections on the books does not mean that we are in a place of full lived equality for our community. 
Um, you know, our, the LGBTQ community still faces significant disparities in accessing healthcare, especially mental health care. Uh, we face disparities in other quality of life indicators, including school performance, graduation rates, employment rates, interactions with law enforcement, just to name a few. And these disparities, as you may or may not know, they get wider, they get deeper if you are transgender or gender nonconforming, if you are a queer immigrant, if you come from a community of color, if you are low income. So when the 2015 US transgender survey tells us that nearly a quarter of the trans community isn't, is not seeking healthcare uh, because they fear being mistreated at their doctor's office, specifically due to their gender identity, and a third of transgender folks didn't seek care because they couldn't afford it, that means there is work still to be done. Uh, when California medical providers up and down the state haven't even heard of HIV prevention medications like pre-exposure prophylaxis, there's work to be done. When school districts refuse to include LGBTQ culturally relevant sex education, there is work to be done. So full lived equality for our community, it must include access to quality health care. Um, and as much as we're working to make sure that California is this beacon of hope for the rest of the country at the state level, you know, we also need to make sure that our congressional delegation is fighting to defend the progress that we've made at a federal level and continuing to help push the needle forward. Uh, so we and our members, we're excited to hear from the candidates tonight, uh, specifically about their plans to expand access to quality affordable health care. Uh, and in doing so, how they would go about ensuring that as access to care is expanded, it is expanded equitably for members of the LGBTQ community, including LGBTQ immigrants, including LGBT people of color, and inc including LGBT people who are experiencing homelessness. That's all facets of our community. So, you know, I, I believe <laughs> that the future is female. Uh, I believe, woo, yes, yes, the future is female, the future is female. I believe that the future is queer. I believe <laughs> that the, I believe that the future is multicultural. So, you know, props to that. Um, but basically that means I think the future looks a heck of a lot more like me <laughs> than it used to a while ago, right? The future of this country looks a lot more like me than it used to. And that, that for me is a sign of hope it's a sign of progress. Um, but we need to make sure that uh, our elected, elected officials will be champions for a more equitable future that accounts for our needs, especially our health needs, um, of the diverse LGBTQ community here in California, but all across the country. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's about all I have to say. Thanks again to the organizers for the event, but also thanks to everyone who's coming out and spending their Monday evening listening to a congressional debate. That's great, that's awesome. Give yourselves a round of applause. And I believe it is my honor to now introduce Kelsey Brewer. Welcome, welcome Kelsey to the stage. What's up CA48, how we doing? You guys can do better than that, right? My name is Kelsey Brewer, and I am a young Democrat here in Orange County and a local activist. And I just want to start off by saying thank you for allowing me to share this space with you all for the next couple of hours as we talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart, um, which is social justice in the United States of America. Um, as a granddaughter of, a civ of civil rights activists that marched with Dr. King in the 1960s, you could say that resisting oppressive social, political, and economic systems comes as naturally as breathing to me. Um, but, but that wouldn't be completely true because for me, my journey of social justice and understanding who I am as a person took over 20 years. <laughs> it's still ongoing. Um, but as a biracial, bisexual, cisgender woman, my own yes, my own truth, very rarely fit into the nose of this world and the rules of this world. Um, and as my own awakening took place, so did my understanding of how I and the people that I love are consistently and systematically exploited on a daily basis. 
And becoming more aware of this allowed me to sit in my anger for quite some time. And let me tell you, after the day I've had today, I could sit in it just a little bit longer. Um, how many of you have ever felt that way? Yeah, I feel you, I'm with you. That, that boiling knotted pit in the bottom of our stomachs that makes us say through gritted teeth, this is wrong, this isn't right. How many of you have felt that way? How many of you have felt that way from someone you love? How many of you have felt that way for someone you have never met before? That boiling rage, that sense of rightness and wrongness is at the core of every social justice movement that this country has ever experienced. But so is love. What I've learned is that you need both. You need the raging anger and the unstoppable love for yourself and for others in order to create any kind of change in this country. Congressional District 48 is a vibrant one, both in terms of race, class, sexuality, gender expression, and identity. And this district deserves to have a representative that not only understands that diversity, but celebrates it and actively works to break down barriers that would seek to punish it. In my humble opinion, all of you in this room deserve a representative that understands three things when it comes to social justice. First, you deserve a representative that understands that oppression is intersectional and systematic. Racial oppression in this country is not about one single white supremacist, but a political system that silences the voices of people of color through gerrymandering, regulating their voices to the margins when in reality, Oftentimes, they are the majority of our communities. It is about a justice system that sends black men to prison 20% longer than white men that commit the exact same crime, only, of course, if they're lucky enough to not be shot dead in the streets. You deserve a Congress member that understands more than just the symptoms of injustice in this country, but the root causes that are directly related to the socio-political and economic systems that we have put into place. You deserve a representative that is courageous enough to propose and enact legislation that fundamentally changes the system. Second, you should elect a person that understands that social justice must be restorative in nature. Atoning for past injustices takes more than just sorry from elected officials. For example, as California and other states, and even now the federal government, weighs in on the impact the war of drug on drugs has had in our communities, the opportunity for restorative justice is ripe. Take the state of Massachusetts. They have taken a restorative justice approach to assess which communities have had the highest overall arrest related to marijuana and incorporates local economic data on unemployment and the number of families living below the poverty line in those communities. They then use all of these factors to designate communities for economic development using the same tax dollars that are now collected from legal sales of marijuana. They have recognized that past criminalization has systematically targeted, exploited, and ravaged poor communities and communities of color, and are working now to rebuild those communities using the restorative justice theory. It's not enough to have a representative that wants weed to be legal. You need a representative that understands how these drug policies have eroded certain communities purposefully and will actively, consciously, and enthusiastically restore justice to them in the same breath. Third and finally, you deserve a representative that understands the concept of sacrifice. I mentioned earlier that anger and love are two things that are required for social justice movements to be successful. But there is a third, and that's sacrifice. Dr. King laid down his life, so did Harvey Milk. Marsha P. Johnson spent years of her life being harassed and abused by police as a trans advocate in New York. Emma Gonzalez and David Hogg are exposed to the most vile of comments for daring to advocate for the right to not be slaughtered in their classrooms. Justice requires sacrifice, and you deserve a representative that is willing to lose everything 
leadership positions, committee appointments, even the office of the 48th district in the pursuit of justice for all people in this district, this county, and this country. True social justice activism requires believing that there are things in life that matter more than ourselves and our own egos. And in that vein, I would like to thank two social justice heroes from the 48th, Laura Oatman and Michael Kotick. Laura, Laura and Michael, thank you for putting your district before yourself. Thank you for putting your country before yourself, for putting Black Lives Matter, for putting Me Too, reproductive freedom, Medicare for all, equal play, DACA and immigration reform, gun control, LGBTQ rights and protections in the 99% before yourselves. Thank you. There are many people in this room and in this district that can and should learn from your example. For too long, this district has been represented by a man that targets the most vulnerable amongst us for fun. That ends today. That ends June 5th. And most importantly, it ends November 6, 2018. And it ends because all of you began. In the tradition of all social justice movements, you looked around on November 9th, 2016 and said, what the hell just happened? <laughs> it ends because all of you question why we even let it get to this point. It ends because all of you have sacrificed your time, your energy, and your passion to create a vision of what better looks like. It ends because of each and every one of you in this room. I wanna leave you all with one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Cornell West. Justice is what love looks like in public. And I would just add this. Be sure to show that love on June 5th. Vote, vote, vote like you and your neighbors' lives depend on it because trust me, it most certainly does. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anthony Wright. I'm the executive director of Health Access California. Health Access is the statewide healthcare consumer advocacy coalition working for the goal of quality, affordable health care for all Californians. We have for 30 years supported the vision of Medicare for All, universal health care. We have, in that time, also worked on the opportunities and the challenges of the moment, working to win health care reforms, secure and expand health care coverage, fight budget cuts, uh, win consumer protections, and promote a healthier California. Um, we have, uh, in, the, in the last decade, we were proud to be a lead organization of the campaign to pass uh, and win the Affordable Care Act in Congress. And in the last year, to defend that victory uh, um, uh, and the progress that, we, that we've made forward. But we, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that defense, but also about steps that we need to take forward because we know that the work is not yet done, that there is a lot more to do than just simply defend our past, uh, our past practices. But how do we take steps forward to get to the goal of quality, affordable health care for all? And so we're really pleased to, to, to be here today. I'm really uh, just, uh, just grateful for the opportunity to be here and to help moderate the first part of your agenda today. Um, your, your, your uh, uh, I will be asking some of the questions about healthcare. Um, I want to be clear that my organization is not an endorsing organization. My interest will simply be, a, be to engage the candidates in a, a health policy debate, to nerd out a little bit. 
on health policy, uh, but also to uh, but also to get a sense of not just uh, what may be the difference between the candidates you have here in terms of substance, but also in terms of style and strategy, so you can make your best decision, because I'm so grateful that you are so engaged and endorsing um, not only as an organization, but as individuals when you go and, and vote um, in June. So again, thank you very much for being here. And with, uh, yeah, please, <laughs> applaud yourself. And so, um, so I'd like to introduce the candidates, uh, and the, I'll be introducing them in reverse order of the Indivisible Voter sub Support Score. And so first, may I introduce Dr. Hans Kirsten. And then, and then next, thank you. And then next, Mr. Harley Ruda. Again, thank you very, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to start with opening statements. My, uh, thank you for your applause. My, our ask is that um, you, from now on, in, uh, indicate your enthusiasm with spirit fingers, with thumbs up, maybe thumbs down if there's something, uh, uh, something that you want to express there. But we want to have as much time so we can get the the, uh, the answers and uh, from these candidates that we have before us. So again, uh, thank you very much. And I want to, uh, again, uh, let us start with an opening statement from, from Dr. Hans Kirsten. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. You know, I've, I've lived in three countries now, and um, I've lived in three different healthcare systems, three different systems of social justice. And having landed in the United States and decided to spend my life here with my family, make a family, I've, I've come to be real embarrassed <laughs> at the state of our healthcare system. You know, nowhere in the world do we have a situation with so many uninsured individuals per capita based on contributions to healthcare. It is absolutely shameful that we are the wealthiest country in the world, but we have tens of millions of people going without healthcare. It is absolutely unconscionable that we are the wealthiest country in the world, but we have the worst outcomes of healthcare. We live not the longest, our life expectancy is lower, our birth rates are lower, our disease accumulation is greater than many countries spending a fraction of what we do on healthcare. It is unconscionable when we have drug companies and insurance companies running our healthcare systems and devastating families, devastating families with outrageous drug prices and unattainable premiums. I have been a healthcare professional my entire life. I have an academic career in which Thank I learned the administration Thank of you. healthcare. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. sorry. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, to uh, opening statement from Mr. Harley Ruda. Thanks, Anthony. Good evening, everyone. It was a little over a year ago, November 2016, when our country elected Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States. And since that time, he has shown us every <laughs> single day in office that he denigrates women, minorities, LGBTQ, our voters, our workers, our refugees, and immigrants. Nothing is below this man. We recognize that his nationalism and his attitude has to change. And you being here is showing that we have the ability to create this blue wave across the country and make a difference. I always think of the famous quote by Martin Niemöller, who was a pastor in Germany who supported the rise of Hitler and nationalism. He ended up in a concentration camp eventually and survived. And his famous quote that many of you have probably seen he said, first they came for the socialist, but I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I'm not Jewish. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Today, in this country, 
we need to, need to stand shoulder to shoulder, locked arm in arm, because an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Again, spirit thinkers, thank you very much. So to, uh, to, to start, to, uh, for Mr. Ruda, um, due to California's implementation of the Affordable Care Act, California has actually had the largest drop of the uninsured rate of all 50 states, from near 20% now down to less than 7%. <laughs> uh, Rep uh, um, Representative Rohrabacher voted to repeal the ACA um, in the Amer American Health Care Act just a year ago. Uh, how would you have voted on the American Health Care Act? And with regard to the ACA, would you, uh, would you uh, repeal it, keep it, expand it, replace it? What would you do with regard to legislation that would come before you? So the, uh, I actually think the number 6.7% is what California has brought it down to. And it's amazing how well we have taken advantage of the ACA for the many uninsured people in California. I support the ACA, but I think we can do better. I believe in Medicare for all. I believe we need to implement that on a national level. I'm glad that California is trying to implement it, but it needs to be done on a national level. And I'm proud of the fact that the California Nurses Association has endorsed our campaign, recognizing that health care is a basic right, a human right that everybody in the United States deserves. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kirsten. Same question. Same question. Yeah, you know, ACA, I believe, is a uh, phenomenal um, institution that was put into place rather poorly and has been maintained rather poorly. Um, although I support it a great deal. The ACA, as you say, insured more Americans in 2016 than had ever been done before. Now, it explained the increase of premiums poorly because everyone got on board without the amortization of costs, so it, they went up. ACA was basically sabotaged by Trump. The rates for uh, enrollment, the period over which enrollment was halved, we have the devastation and basically crippling of that system by eliminating its um, electronic budget, seven, no, eliminating its uh, television budget, 75% of its electronic budget eliminated while stopping the payments from the Constitution, sorry, from Congress out to insurance companies. So rates went up. So it was an active sabotage, and then a year later, starting to rip that system down. We need to back that system up. We need to hold big pharma accountable. We need to hold insurance companies accountable. They are the ones running our healthcare systems right now, and we must regulate that system rather than what Trump has been doing is putting in a series of deregulations of that system. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Anthony, do I have, can I add one thing? I think we've got 30 seconds. Sure. And, and while Trump has systematically attempted to decimate the ACA, uh, a lot of blame can be placed on the Republican Congress who removed the risk corridors that were set up to provide basically reinsurance for the companies that were underwriting the ACA. They took the funding away. And with that is when we really saw premiums start to rise. So we'll give a fair share of the blame to the Republican Congress as well. Okay, um, so Dr. K uh, Dr. Kirsten, then let's uh, follow up with you on that issue. Um, we'll get to the broader vision of Medicare for All, but let's talk about some of the issues of sabotage that but you both referenced. Senators Murray and Alexander were working on a proposal that would reestablish the reinsurance that redistributes money from insurers, depending on which ones would get a sicker risk pool, uh, which has been shown to help lower premiums. Uh, that, that reinsurance risk corridors and others were defunded by efforts of Senator Marco Rubio and others who call them an insurance or bailout. So would you support such a federal bill to establish reinsurance, uh, at least in that concept? And do you think that this is an effective way of lowering insurance costs? Yeah, I would. It's a, it's a system that we need to put in as a stopgap before we can get a universal health care system in place. We've got to bring uh, costs down. And there's a number of t tweaks and tunes that we can do to the ACA, that being one, in order to drop our costs. We've got to simultaneously insure the insurers that their bills are going to get paid so that they can amortize and bring their costs down amongst all of us while we are tuning that system that has just an unbelievable amount of abuse in it. So for example, we've got almost $200 billion annually that is being wasted on uh, loopholes and um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, insurance. Sorry, they're, uh, sorry I'm, I'm actually kind of sick right now. I'm, 
my apologies. I'm kind of losing my uh, train of thought. We have $200 billion being wasted per year on um, Medicare fraud and me medical malpractice abuses. Again, tightening those things are another way of gaining more um, money into the system. Uh, thank you. Mr. Ruda. I think it's important we talk about health care. You need to understand there's roughly 200 countries in the world. And of those 200 countries, 40 of them are considered industrialized developed countries. And those 200 countries follow one of four models. Those 40 industrialized developed countries, they have universal health care, and they tend to follow one of the three key models. One is the beverage model, which is where the hospitals and the staff and the nurses and doctors all work for the government. The second model is the Bismarck model. It's where the employers and employees fund health care for the citizens of those countries. The third model is the national model, where you have a national tax that provides health care insurance for everybody in the country. And then the fourth model is no model at all for 160 countries where you pay for Medicare, medical assistance, barter for it, or simply go without it. The United States has all four models. The first model is veteran affairs. The second model is what we typically see with our employer-employee relationship. That third model is Medicare. And for 30 million Americans, we have the fourth model, which is no model at all. That's why we spend 18.5% of our GDP versus half that with these other industrialized developed countries. We need to move to Medicare for all now. Open it up and make it available and get the individual mandate back in place. And in the interim, make sure the ACA continues as a stopgap measure as we move towards that direction. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Ruta, just to follow, um, uh, follow up then, I think one of the uh, other efforts that are to uh, sabotage My the Mark Rubio moment here. Uh, <laughs> while you're drinking, uh, the, um, the other efforts to sabotage the ACA include proposals to promote um, junk insurance plans, sometimes called short-term insurance or association health plans. In each of these cases, they, don't, they do not have to abide by the ACA consumer protections, don't have to abide by essential health benefits, annual lifetime limits, and can deny for pre-existing conditions. Would you, uh, would you, uh, uh, there's legislation pending to uh, promote these products, or would you seek to ban them um, as a, a state ver version of a bill SB 910 would seek to do? I think it is a effort to continue to divide us in providing universal health care. But I can't emphasize enough that us spending lots of time trying to uh, uh, put stops in the holes of the dikes of the ACA that are being committed by the Republican Party versus looking long term at providing universal health care through Medicare for all is not the best direction. Again, ACA is a great program and it got a lot of people insurance that needed it. But we have to go further than that. We have to quit thinking about how do we just save the ACA. We need to think about universal health care via Medicare for all for the entire United States. And if anybody wants to buy private insurance, buy private insurance. More power to you. But everybody should have available, affordable health care through Medicare, individuals and companies. And I think that's where our focus needs to be. Okay. Dr. Kirsted, to same question. Um, you know, the junk bonds, no, um, not at all. Mm -hmm. um, they are a, a stopgap measure that uh, is a very temporary fix to a very difficult problem, and we should be looking for proper solutions. Basically, they won't, won't pay for people with pre-existing conditions, and they also have caps on annual um, allocations and lifetime premiums. So we, we can't be going anywhere near that. We have to be establishing a proper system of health care. And I'm of the mind that we can actually be tuning the ACA while we're putting in a uh, single-payer system. A single-payer system, we can't flip our fingers and have that put into place. That's been tried, and it has failed. I think we learned a great deal from those failures, and we can actually march a path that is a lot more logical, a lot more rational to get that thing done. In the meantime, we've got to pick up the uninsured. We are devastating our own country and our own people by not attending to this and putting politics in front of this issue that is so critical to our nation. Okay. Mr. Ruda. Yeah, I would suggest that single-payer systems do work. The other 39 countries that are industrialized, developed countries have proven it works. They deliver health care at half the cost the United States does per person. The only state that's even thought about attempting a single-payer system is Vermont. And they passed the legislation but didn't implement it because they felt the costs were too high. So we don't have a good example in the United States as to a single-payer system and universal health care. So we can learn from other countries. We can Thank do this. You.
Um, I, 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 we're we're going to get to the broader conversation universal coverage, but a few more things just about some of the bills that you might be, that you that you both both might be seeing in a in a future Congress with regard to specific fixes to the system, and just one more, which is about uh, a question about. Um, Right now, there's a rule in Congress that says insurers uh, in the Affordable Care Act that insurers must spend at least 80 to 85 percent of their premium dollar on patient care rather than administration and profit. The Trump administration is actually seeking to lower that to 70 percent. Um, there's legislation in the there's legislation in, at the state level to actually raise it to 90 percent. Which direction would you go, or do you have other proposals for specific uh, uh, regulations on insurers or uh, other patient protections? Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Ruda first. Obviously, you want as much of the premium as possible going to the health care of the patient. But I'm not going to pass judgment as to what that number is without looking at the overall numbers, understanding what type of profit margins are in place already. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I'd rather see us have more nonprofit underwriters than for-profit underwriters, which obviously creates the uh, requirement that a return to shareholders be uh, embedded into the cost of health care, uh, but without reading the actual bill, I, 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 it's difficult to pass judgment. Okay. So it, it needs to stay about 80 to 85 percent. That calculation was actually done at, the, at a multi-year long negotiation. It, we have to stay there. It's a typical Trumpian in order to allow these companies more money for profits, more money for advertising for that circular benefit for profit. We have um, Pharmaceutical companies and providers right now making record profits. They are making more profits um, than other industries in the sector. They're making more profits than other industries outside of the sector. And they are spending a record amount of money on advertising in order to perpetuate that cycle. We've got to stick with what we were, we, we worked extremely hard to get to, which was an 80 to 85 percent spend on healthcare. I appreciate that. So, uh, so you're proposing not to, not to lower or to raise to, to stay Correct. where it is. And, and uh, Mr. Ruda, you, you don't have, you don't have a position at this time. Correct. Okay. Um, another uh, issue that has come up is that you know the Affordable Care Act does provide significant subsidies for people who uh, are buying coverage in the individual market through Covered California. Over 1.5 million Californians get coverage through Covered California, and 90 percent of them get subsidies. But in a high cost of living state, um, that's still, that may not be enough. That uh, it may not be enough for people to to able to afford coverage. Would you support uh, increasing covered California subsidies in, um, for middle income Californians, perhaps even going over the 400 percent of the federal poverty level, which is about 48 thousand for an individual, um, to be to be able to provide some subsidies so people can um, not have to pay more than a certain percentage of their income for coverage, um, Dr. Kirsten. Yes, absolutely. It really does relate to the last thing you said, which is the most important part, is a percentage of your income. Uh, it, in this country, we spend more on health care as a percentage of an income than most other countries. We can't be doing that. It, and it's worse care. So yes, I would support increased subsidies so individuals can actually catch up. They can keep some money for savings and for education, feeding their children. Okay. Mr. Ruda. Yes, it needs to be indexed based on the cost of living by area. And uh, is there, a, a, uh, so another thing with regard to expanding help for people in California. Um, two years ago, California expanded our Medi-Cal program to include all children regardless of immigration status. Now over 200,000 children benefit from this program. Would you support expanding the Medicaid program federally so California can get federal share for, the, uh, for these children? Um, and the follow-up is would you support expanding, expanding Medicaid for undocumented adults as well? Mr. Ruda. Yes, and when I talk about Medicare for all or some of these other measures that provide some level of assistance to subgroups, uh, the answer would be for all residents of the United States of America. Thank you. You know, 19, 19 states um, don't have this program, and those that do love it. We need to be able to expand and bring it into all these states. So yes, federally, I would be pushing for expansion of the program to all states and also allowing those states to try the experiments that California has been so brilliant at. California has been the great experimenter and we've seen so much good come out of it, like drug pricing reforms, SB 17, uh, 790, 596. These are all three bills that allow us, and it's only California, 
to really get into the weeds on regulating drug pricing, mandating that companies have to actually show their math in how they determine drug prices, mandating that you can't give gifts if you're a pharmaceutical company or an insurer to the doctors in order to get them to charge their prices. We've done a great job. Not only would I want to expand Medicaid to all, to all states, but also those three bills that I just named. And in addition, the general sentiment of California, let states play. Let states innovate and be like California, young, innovative, new in their expressions, and then we can adopt and replicate throughout the United States. Dr. Kirsten, just so I understand, you talked about the, the 19 states that uh, did, have not expanded Medicaid under the ACA. Uh, uh, so I, I appreciate that answer, but I wanted to be clear about the, the question about whether we would want to expand Medicaid to undocu undocumented, oh, yes. which is not... Um, which. I'm sorry I failed to answer the question. No. Yes, of course. Yeah, I think we should. Okay, thank you. The, um, so let us get to this broader question of uh, how do we get to universal coverage? And so, um, Dr. Kirsten, let's start with you. Not only do you support universal coverage, which are, are, you've already indicated, but what's your plan to achieve it? How would you surmount the obstacles, whether it's industry opposition or financing, or even just assuring people about the coverage that they have now? What, it, so... Um, talked about, about your support for universal coverage, but also how you get there. Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult question in 90 seconds, but the have-nots are here, and the haves are here. What a single-payer system does is this, and this is the problem. Pulling down health care for those Americans who work hard, pay their bills, and enjoy a standard of care that is unmatched in the world. Our health care systems for the haves is truly phenomenal health care. But in order to do this, it pulls them down. I am writing three bills right now. I'm just expanding into a fourth, and I have vowed to have those things written and ready by February when I take office that are tweaks for the, the ACA in order to bring this up. And they are pricing transparency, medical record systems reform, generics, um, altering the generics laws to get them away from patents and into healthcare, for God's sakes. So that when we bring this up and we have a system where all Americans are actually being covered, we can then put in a universal healthcare system. At that point, we won't have everybody covered, but we will be probably at the greatest gains ever experienced in this country. And then the normalization with a concierge care for those that wish to afford it. So um, you mentioned several um, important type of price control, price control or price uh, issues, bills to address <coughs> prices. Uh, do you think that that's the fundamental, just as a follow-up, do you think that that's really the issue to get to universal, or does there need to be more assistance for um, people who, uh, who can't afford the system now, for middle or I income folks, for, uh, for low-income folks? I, so I, I guess I'm just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit more about, to, to, to the question of universal coverage. Sure. How, what would be the steps to get there, in addition to the price issues, which we'll also talk about later? Sure. What I was giving there is, that's how we get there by increasing costs, but I'll just be clear. It's money, money, money. A, a universal health care system just in this state alone would add two to three hundred billion dollars annually to our cost of care. And we spend the last number I heard was three hundred seventy three billion. That's a phenomenal increase. We can't have that by snapping our fingers. Marijuana taxes will not give us that amount of money. Trump is certainly not going to do a state transfer. And is the state going to come up with it? No, it is money. Okay. My measures are about increasing the uh, efficiency of the system to get that money. Okay. Mr. Ruda. Would you repeat the question, please? <laughs> do, um, do, you su do you support universal coverage? But what is it, but, and assuming you do, what is your plan to achieve universal coverage? How would you, how would you surmount mount obstacles from industry opposition to financing to assuring people concerned about re replacing the coverage they have? So as I mentioned earlier, we spend 18.5% of our GDP on health care in the United States. So any action we take to create universal health care and move towards Medicare for all, we need to make sure that we do it with as few unanticipated consequences as possible. So to me, the first two things we do is you have to open up Medicare for all so that any individual or any business can buy into it. 
Medicare has proven consistently over and over that they can deliver quality health care at prices lower than the private insurance industry. In addition, we need to reinstate the individual mandate. If you can afford to pay for insurance, you need to buy insurance either in the private market or under this example, Medicare. And we also need to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices. There are limitations on their ability to, to negotiate drug prices uh, due to big pharma uh, exercising their lobbying efforts. So those would be the first two steps. And those two steps, I believe, will show cost coming out of the system and quality health care being provided. And by doing so, we can then look at lowering those premiums further and further for those participating in Medicare. And again, you can still have a private insurance market. So if anybody wants to go out and buy private insurance and not uh, use the, uh, the benefits provided by Medicare, uh, they should certainly have that right. And I hope we talk about Senator uh, Bernie Sanders' bill at some point as well. So, it, I mean, just to follow up, uh, so it, I guess let's, let's divide up the issue of uh, the ideal goal. In your ideal goal, would it be a Medicare for all system that everybody's in? Or do you s sort of see it as a bifurcated system where there is um, a, a Medicare, but then there's also a private market outside, outside of it? And, or do you, are, you, are you saying that more as the transition plan? No, I'm saying that would stay in place. Virtually every single payer system in the world still has private insurance available uh, for folks who want to buy it. In fact, uh, uh, we were in, in Great Britain uh, uh, about six, eight months ago, and it's fascinating talking to the people there. Some of them are uh, on, on the, uh, the government-sponsored health plan. Some are on private insurance. Some are on corporate insurance. Some bounce back and forth. But they know they've got that safety net of, 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 of care for all that's so important. Okay. Um, Dr. Kirsten, do you have any response to uh, Mr. Ruda and vice versa? Since, since you, you both sure. are engaging these issues in slightly different ways, so I'd love to, to see if, there's, if you have any response and vice yeah. versa. You know, I just want to add one little bit of clarity on uh, uh, other single-payer systems, as using them as models. You know, I grew up in Canada, single-payer system, and I schooled in England, single-payer system. They are not excellent. They are uh, systems where people leave in order to come to America for better care. When you want to pay for extra care, which you can do, which is the great thing there, it's too bad you have to, but you do, you can't get it. You wait in lines, you have to pay more, but there's just not as many MRIs per capita. There's not as many excellent specialists per capita. So people come to this area in order to ex get that care. So. It's not a perfect system where we can look at and say, well, let's just replicate that. It's not a system we want to emulate. It is a single-payer system that ensures everybody, or sorry, provides care for everybody, yes, but at great cost to the general average quality of care, which is much lower than the vast majority of insured people in the United States. The trick is to do both. Okay. We can do it. We have the tax base. Thank you. Mr. Ruda, any we're already paying for universal health care in the least efficient way possible, right? Go to the emergency room instead of have preventive care for 30 million Americans. What? That is not good use of dollars. That's not a good way to provide medical care for our citizens. So, you know, these other systems that are in these other countries, sure, do some people leave the country to go have medical services done because they can afford to do it and get a higher level of services than they think they can get in the current country? Sure. But are... Millions and millions of people in those countries having basic insurance as a human right? Yes. I think that's a fair trade. As long as we continue to allow private insurance, innovation, and the ability for people to make free choice, yet still have a safety net, is the right direction to go. Okay. You, uh, you both talked about safety nets. So, um, uh, Dr. Kirsten, let me uh, talk about... The, the House budget resolution, which Representative Rohrabacher voted for, would have put a cap on the Medicaid program, cutting it by over a trillion dollars over a decade. The Trump administration's budget, uh, budget is seeking to impose work requirements in Medicaid and other social safety net uh, pr uh, programs. So would you support or oppose these efforts? And what is actually your vision for a Medicaid program going forward? Uh, it is a program that covers a third of Californians, including half of our children and two-thirds of our nursing home residents. Yeah, you know, capping Medicaid is ridiculous. It's just, we can't be doing that. Um, in fact, I'd like to expand the uh, ability of Medicaid and uh, Medicare to negotiate directly 
with um, uh, providers so that they can actually secure better uh, pricing. Um, Medicaid, it's, an, it's interesting. Expansion of Medicaid in this, um, in this state to cover the 2.7 million uninsured would be about a $10 billion additional cost, whereas a single payer would be about a, uh, the, it varies from one to 300 billion, depending on how you calculate it. So an expansion of Medicaid system is actually a much, much faster and inexpensive way than instigate instituting a 562 off the bat. So it's a nice stepping stone. It's a way to get uh, a lot of people insured quickly while we're moving towards a single payer system. Um, I mean, I, I do want to, uh, so you would exp expand ex ex existing Medicaid program. In fact, um, I would defend the current Medicaid program, certainly, mm -hmm. and uh, stop all caps of it. Yes. Um, Mr. Ruta, same question. I, I think there's a bigger issue at play here. There's a reason the Republicans did the tax cuts they did and created an additional a trillion and a half in deficit in an effort to basically cut social programs down the road and use that as a reason why. This is one of the first times in the history of our country when we have a growing economy that we are increasing the national deficit. It's just the opposite. When you have a strong economy, that's the time when you're supposed to be creating surpluses to bring down the deficit. And the Republican uh, and, and, and ultra-wealthy billionaires are doing this in an effort to, to strip social service programs of money. And that's why Rohrbacher supports doing this and will continue to do it and, and why he needs to go. The, the, uh, in, terms of the, in, in terms of the things, one of the questions, and I know we talked about it in the Women's Forum, but um, it's cr crucial to this, is one of the efforts by the GOP was to defund Planned Parenthood, which I... Uh, which doesn't actually get any specific line items in the federal budget, but what they want to do is take it out of the Medicaid um, right. uh, provider network. Um, what do you have any legislative solutions that you have? What do you think about this, and what legislative solutions do you have to prevent this threat to services to Planned Parenthood? Uh, uh, Mr. Ruda. Fund Planned Parenthood, remove the Hyde Amendment, provide free and accessible birth control to any woman anywhere in the United States and allow women to have full control over their bodies and eliminate it from the federal government. I don't know what else to say about it but that. And the best way we can do that, by the way, is get a Congress with Democrats, a Senate with Democrats, and a White House with a Democrat and get it passed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kirsten, same question. Uh, you know, same answer. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely ridiculous that a, uh, an organization that's preventative, that a dollar there results in 20 or $30 of savings later is being defunded, that's being attacked. So there's absolutely no reason to do this. And one of the things that I'm doing in my life right now, my day job, <laughs> is uh, treating women with ovarian cancer. If these women were able to actually see that coming and take prophylactic actions against it, their lives would not be tortured. Their husbands would not be tortured, their children, their greater communities. It's just such a devastation and I see it every day, literally. We've got to fund Planned Parenthood to allow them to put those protections into place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you uh, on another question about as we broaden out to start to broaden out to social services, uh, Dr. Kirsted, do you support the implementation of supervised consumption services, health services where individuals are able to use illicit drugs in a clinical setting with expert supervision and sterile supplies? Do you support uh, the implementation of such uh, supervised consumption services? Well, I'd have to, you know, I, I reserve the yes um, till I know exactly what the drugs are. You know, we, we have um, uh, a very, it's a very safe but a very antiquated FDA system, uh, Federal Drug, Drug Administration. The FDA in this country is very, very old and it needs revision. So yes, I do think under a clinical guidance, we should be experimenting and adding research into drugs that could be used for other purposes. For example, marijuana, we need more research into that drug. It is being used extraordinarily effectively for care of cancer patients where it really started in its legitimate 
um, life and is now being expanded into many, many diseases, multiple sclerosis, etc. And we need to take that out of a substance, one classification, so we're not jailing people over something so silly as consuming that drug. And we need to spend some research dollars and gather that data so we, we know how it works and what to use it for precisely. This, in answering your question, is the type of principles we need to apply for every illicit drug under investigation. Um, Mr. Ruda, same question. Yeah, the war on drugs has been an utter failure. And part of that failure is based on the fact that the, it has made some drugs not even have the potential to be studied for health benefits. And I think that's what you're driving at. Would we allow those drugs to be able to be investigated and understood better as to how they can help someone? And the answer is yes, I would support that within existing uh, government oversight and accountability and transparency. I, I, I think the question is actually more toward what some people have called needle exchange or types of programs where, again, if you're going to have uh, people who are the proponents of these types of programs, say, if you're going to have folks who are frankly addicted, then they should be able to have a, a place where they can go and, and deal with their addiction that is safe and clean and appropriate, okay. as opposed to the, the research aspects of it, which I think um, um, both of you mentioned. So I'll ask you again, uh, first, Mr. Root, about that type of situation. Yeah, actually, there's great studies in other countries that show that providing addicts with a safe place to uh, uh, basically have drug intake to address their addiction reduces crime, reduces health care issues, and provides, obviously, a safer place for the community and, most importantly, an opportunity to work with that addict and move them off of the addiction. Uh, I do support that. I think the best place to start that is in the states. I uh, uh, agree that states have the ability, the innovation, and the understanding to address these issues at the local level, and I believe we should explore it. And, and if we have successful outcomes, we have successful benchmarks, case studies that we could expand that into other communities. Okay. Um, Dr. Kirsten, do you have any clarification or, or yeah, is, let um, your answer stand? Yeah, some, so I agree with that. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, the Mental Health Parity and um, Addictions um, Act, uh, in, in, we need to be backing that up. That is an act that allows a transparency for management of addictions and mental health care. And it's one that's being eroded, especially so in the current administration. So I'd only add to uh, Mr. Ruta's question or answer that um, we need to also back that act up. But you would, al but you would also support these types of supervised yes. clinical uh, of type sessions? OK. Um, broadening it out to the question, and I'll do start with Mr. Ruta here. How would you directly address the high cost of health care? So again, talked a lot about access, and we, we moved into this already, but just broadly, how do you deal with health care costs? Yeah, I, I did touch on it earlier. I do believe opening up Medicare for all because of the ability, proven ability to provide medical services at lower rates is a huge first step in that direction. And second, giving Medicare and, and the U.S. government the ability to negotiate pharmaceutical prices. Uh, third, pharmaceutical uh, costs right now are disproportionately paid by U.S. taxpayers and, and, and U.S. residents. So we provide the innovative research through our taxpayer dollars so the uh, big pharma can overcharge us for it and charge it for lower rates in other parts of the country to basically run their profits even higher and higher. Uh, that is a flawed system that needs to change, and, and legislatively, we can make those changes. Thank you. Dr. Kirsten. I can't stress this enough. Pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies are at record high profits. They are spending more on advertising than they ever have year after year over the last three years, more over the last two than they ever have in the history of the United States. We've got to get to a system where we can modulate drug pricing. It is completely unregulated nationally. We need to take SB 17, 790, and 587 national so that we can actually see how these companies are doing this. I invented a drug for the number one genetic killer of infants. I had to take it to England in order to get that thing approved. And because of some ridiculous laws that were antiquated in the United States that said I couldn't operate on a baby unless there was a human uh, adult first. There is no adult form of this disease. So I go to England, I invent this drug, I get it passed. There's another drug at the time that I let move in because it did these babies less harm. That drug that I stepped aside for cost $53 in order to make 
It turns out that the drug company last year that just put it into the marketplace is charging $750,000 annually for that drug. How much would you pay to save the life of your dying baby? They know the answer is everything and anything. We need to regulate drug pricing. We need pricing transparency. We need medical record systems reform. And we need access to generics that are inexpensive for this. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kirsted. Um, so, I mean, just to, since you both mentioned prescription drug prices, and, um, and I appreciate the shout out to SB17. My organization was a co-sponsor. That's right. But, um, the, uh, but, I, but you know, transparency can get so far, but at the end of the day, it's transparency. It's not a regulation. So, I mean, so what would be the mechanism that you would use, and would you actually change the patent laws, which gives, uh, which gives drug companies a monopoly for many years to price whatever they want, or would you, would you change that, or, or what other changes to the system would you make in order yeah. to actually deal with regulate what does regulate prices drug prices mean to you yeah very very good question so sb17 and the like is mm -hmm. is a start yes. it's a very very good start that says you've got to show us your math so that we can have 60 days to outcry so what would we do if only we if we only had sb17 i as a congressman would be standing up the deepest broadest expert in healthcare on the hill and i would be saying everyone stand up we have 60 days here. I would be on NBC Evening News. I would be using the podium that I have in order to scream as loud as I could to say, come on, America, this is wrong. People are dying. Then I would go further by not only um, putting SB 17 nationally, but actually put some guts to the thing. Regulate the amount of cap that they, basically cap the amount of the, of, uh, the price that they can charge for a new drug. All of their new drugs come out very expensive, and then after a few years, they go cheap because generics start competing with them. You can negotiate with these big pharmaceutical companies. I know we don't want to negotiate with big pharma. We have to. They control over 90% of the drugs that you've ever had. We need someone at the table who can say, we need to cap this. You may charge an extra 10 cents on that drug down there or those 80 drugs down there, but do not devastate our families. Do not devastate our poor. Do not devastate our aged. Regulate that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ruda, same question. You know, Laura Oatman has talked a lot about we don't really have health care in the, in the United States. We have sick care. And that sick care is embedded in this entire system to really continue keeping all of us in the mill, selling us drugs that we don't need, selling those drugs at high prices, having the insurance companies pay for it and increase our premiums over and over. And the advertising that we see ad nauseum over and over on TV, guess what? You're paying for that, right? So SB 17 is a step in the direction of trying to address what are the true hidden costs of these drugs. But the thing that would address it best is getting the leverage back in the hands of the people by having a single payer system. Because if you have a single payer system that has the shackles removed that have been put on by Congress to negotiate drug prices, or if we had a single payer system here in California, the ability to negotiate those prices would certainly provide transparency and the ability to drive cost down. So SB 17 can play an important role, but a more important role is make sure the leverage is in the hands of the people. Okay, thank you. Mr. So you both um, had, you know, talked about drug companies, you talked about insurers, but over two thirds of our healthcare bill is doctors and hospitals. And, uh, and for many of us, we don't have a lot of choices when we get doc a, a, a care from a medical group or from a hospital. The, the hospital that we, there's not a lot of time to, a lot of time to comparison shop when we're on the, in the ambulance. So then, the, so then the question is, how would you deal with the, the price of health care? Americans don't use health care any more than anybody else. Uh, the, the prices are just that much more higher in America. So what would you do about the price of medical groups, hospitals, uh, and the base cost of health care? Um, Mr. Ruta, start, to start. Well, it, it goes back again to having the ability to leverage m numerous people under one system. So you already have underwriters doing that to some degree right now. Underwriters are already negotiating with doctor groups and hospitals for pricing now. And that's why if you have health care insurance, you see this price, then you see it negotiated down to this, and that's what you get. If you don't have health care insurance, you get the full boat. 
So allowing the, the assimilation of more people under a common plan provides an opportunity for greater negotiation, greater ability to drive down prices, greater ability to force doctors groups and hospitals to be transparent in their pricing so that you can help take out some of the unanticipated uh, cost and get the same quality of service. And I would certainly support that. Would you, uh, I mean, even in a single payer system, if there is in a rural community one hospital, though, then there is, the, you know, negotiation can only go so, so far. Is there a role for regulating them like utilities or some, some other mechanism for um, dealing with a, a cost where, where there is just only one specialist in an area or only one hospital in an area? Well, you know, I always think capitalism is still the, the best form of uh, uh, running an economy on the face of the planet, uh, but it has to have appropriate checks and balances. And if an appropriate check and balance along those lines is needed in those types of markets, then certainly we should take a look at it. But you also have to keep in mind, too, and we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, part of the reason your health care costs are so high is because we're providing universal health care in the least efficient method, and that is the emergency room instead of instead of making sure that people have access to preventive health care. That alone would, again, bring those prices down. Okay. Dr. Kirsten, same question to you. Yeah, let, let's be clear. You don't know what you pay for health care. <laughs> you don't know what you pay at every hospital or any hospital you have ever been to. You don't know how much the service costs. Isn't that amazing? Think of another sector where you have no idea yet I, it is the single largest chunk of your money, and you have no idea what you're spending it on and what you're getting for it. And to answer your question precisely, there are two things that we can do, and one of them is called pricing transparency. I'm writing a bill on it right now. When you go to the hospital and you get a, a drip, one of them costs 100 bucks and one of them costs 10 bucks, and you have no idea that they, they have three to five of them in case there's a recall of product. Hospitals work on margins. They take the $100 one all the time. Pricing transparency law would mandate that you would be able to see every single medicine, every single service, and what it cost. You would pick the $10 one, unless you love Gucci and Prada. <laughs> People who buy for hospitals, they also have no pricing transparency. If we had this, we would get about an 8% reduction. 8% reduction. That's phenomenal in one-fifth of our economy. And the second answer, to be direct, is that Medicare requires the right to negotiate. They are completely out of the table. Not completely, but they almost are completely out of the table. We've got to get them negotiating. Okay. And Dr. Kirsten, same follow-up question as Mr. Ruda. The, you know, in, situa in situations in... Um, a recent UC Berkeley Petra Center report said that 44 of our 58 counties are highly concentrated healthcare markets at both the, at both the physician, hospital, and health plan level. So mm -hmm. in, in that level of concentration, sh uh, should there be some sort of regula um, not just negotiation, but regulation of prices with regard to hospitals, medical groups, or other um, providers? Just for gross caps, but I also agree that capitalism is going to drive the day. If you had pricing transparency, you guarantee to get capitalism driving that day. Right now, you let capitalism run wild, and guess what? You don't know what you're paying. Your costs just keep escalating. The CEOs are all meeting and saying, ha, huh, I'm gonna raise drug prices. Why don't you raise them too? Because the public doesn't know, because there is no pricing transparency. Capitalism does not work in a system without transparency. There must be transparency. Um, so, Dr. Kirstead, um, last two questions for, uh, for both of you. Number one is just, we've talked about access and cost. Let's uh, make sure there's some about quality and equity. How do we keep the health industry accountable to improve quality and to equity, and particularly how to deal with racial and ethnic disparities uh, where we have these disparities in our healthcare system, even among people with the same type of insurance and the same income? So it's it, it, the same person, an African American with the same income and the same insurance does have worse health outcomes out of our healthcare system than so, to somebody who, who is not. Uh, how would we keep the health industry accountable to deal with those types of quality and equity issues? Great question. I'm sorry, was it me first? Yes. Yeah. Great, great question. Um, you know, the, uh, the more money you make, the higher your life expectancy in America. That's just a fact. And that's disgusting. It is ridiculous that in the number one wealthiest nation in this world, 
that the more money you make, the greater your life expectancy. It's sinful. It's completely wrong. We should all be standing up and screaming bloody murder because of this. It's wrong that the poorer you are, it correlates perfectly with your environmental surroundings. So you live near a port. You live without proper services. Your air quality is worse. The likelihood of your child having asthma is worse. There is gross social injustice in our healthcare system, let alone if you're LGBTQ. If I was asked to be part of an LGBTQ panel on healthcare, not as a congressional candidate, but as an expert in healthcare. And one of the most beautiful things that Barack Obama did for that group was to put questions onto the National Information Survey. Five questions only. LGBTQ are n it's not one group of people. It's several groups of people. We need multiple questions. From those questions, we have untold benefit to our society, untold benefit to that community, drops in costs. We need to increase those questions, which are again now in the Trump administration in jeopardy. Research, data, issues in front of politics. Mr. Ruda, same question. How do we deal with quality and equity, keeping them accountable to deal with uh, quality and also racial and ethnic disparities? Yeah, we, we have to look at the fact that minorities and people of color are already at a disadvantage when it comes to quality of life and the health care issues that result from it. Uh, whether it's environmental issues, being in situations where they're exposed to greater pollution, to the foods and stock that they have access to, uh, less fresh foods, more GMOs, more uh, situations where they're not getting the same quality of opportunity in food and health care and living conditions that middle class and upper class have. It also means they don't have access to as high a quality of medical care as well. So we have to make sure, to answer your question, make sure that in providing Medicare for all, that the premiums that are attached to that for those individuals that pay, it has to be colorblind and socioeconomically blind as to the individuals that are receiving the benefits. And by doing that, you're creating a consistent class of participants and taking out those types of factors in a, in a successful way. The, the last question, we talked about policies, but I wanna get a sense of your strategy with regard to going forward. And so Mr. Ruta, uh, starting with you, um, what, what would be your style and, and, and strategy for moving forward on this? What committees would you seek to be on? What, what caucuses would you join? What strategies would you seek? You know, would you be the person who puts out the uh, legis legislation to move the, uh, move the vision forward or the one that tries to um, work with Repu Republicans to get something bipartisan through? Um, be curious about your, your overall strategy with regard to advancing the agenda you laid out. Yeah, and I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to be Pollyanna and tell you that I've got four pieces of legislation I'm going to deliver on day one because that's not how Congress works for freshman congressmen. Uh, they actually have a black box where they put those things and it never comes out to the committee floor. The reality is what you do as a freshman congressman is you work with other congressional members and you work on bills that are already there, ready to have your name added to them as a co-sponsor and support it. And that's exactly what I would do. I would support existing bills out there, such as the Equality Act and many others. I would work with the congressional members that have endorsed our <laughs> campaign, such as Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, Congressman uh, Pete Aguilar, uh, Alan Lowenthal, Lou Correa, and work with them to support legislation. And then finally, what we all have as a member of Congress is this and this. Everywhere we go, we have a podium and a microphone to lead people and get them passionate about making a difference in healthcare, by getting passionate about making Medicare available for all. And I promise you, whether it's town hall meetings and anywhere else I go, I will take my podium, I will take my microphone, and I will make my voice heard in an effort to lead others to where we need to be. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kirsted, same question. What would be your strategy for moving the agenda that you just talked about? What caucuses would you join or committees would you seek to be on? And, what, and who would you want to work with with regard to pushing your, the legislation that, you, that you've talked about? You know, I, um, I'm excited about this. You know, the uh, seniority equation isn't just time in, in Congress. A seniority equation is time and field experience in the sector. So I will actually have a fair degree of seniority in this particular issue because it is both time as well as experience in a sector. I'm very pleased with that. I, I would be bipartisan because cancer doesn't care if you're red or blue. Cancer does not care if you are red or blue. It is as 
enticing for a Republican to hear that I'm going to be decreasing costs of health care as it is for a Democrat who can look at it and say, well, 17 million more people are going to get health care because of that bill. It does make sense to write bills. It does make sense to get those things in the House because those bills that I just mentioned have not been put into the House yet. I have talked to administration about an appointment on appropriations in the Science Committee. I am not so foolish as to think that they would make guarantees to a, to a candidate, nor did I ever say so. But I have had those conversations, and those would be my choices. Appropriations, because it's the purse. Science, because it's a laughing stock right now, <laughs> frankly, and needs to be completely overhauled. And it is a platform where we can actually bring more people together with sensical views, with healthcare views, people who actually think about putting facts in front of politics. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, so I just want to I just want to thank um, both you gentlemen for uh, your time and your focus on this issue, uh, and this audience for uh, bearing with my questions and and hopefully uh, getting a 101 in health policy. So thank you very much. And with that, I want to introduce your own chairman of Indivisible OC48, Aaron McCall. <laughs> Can we, can we give Anthony a round of applause real quick? That was amazing. Absolutely. Great job. Thank a you. Anthony didn't also mention that he is Kamala Harris's advisor on healthcare policy. So you guys got the best of the best tonight. Um, right. So um, I want to just do a real quick check in. How's everyone doing on stage? Can we go for the next bit of questions? We good? Yeah, yeah. All right. Better. Cool. Um, all right, so the first thing that I wanted to do was I just wanted to make a real quick um, point of privilege to talk about um, American social justice because I think there's the idea that we say all men and women and um, different genders are created equal and we have the right to pursue happiness and social justice comes in when we don't have the same abilities to reach that happiness when we aren't getting the same rights and privileges. And so that's why this is super important to me because every one of you have seen this administration attack us in one way or the other, and you're saying, this is blocking my American right to freedom and the pursuit of happiness. And so I wanna thank each and every one of you um, for being here tonight. So um, I'm going to go real quick with the rapid fire question. I also wanted to um, give a real quick shout out and thank you to um, Mr. Ruda, because last time we had the rapid fire questions with red, green, and yellow cards. And um, he brought up a point about colorblindness. And I think about social justice for me. <laughs> social justice is about being open to seeing things that other people see and other people experience that you don't see and you don't experience and then making ways to acclimate that and to make it so that everyone has an equal playing field. So now the cards say yes, no, and expand. So we're gonna do these rapid fire questions so that we can get through them real quickly. So the first question um, for you guys is, would you support the bill HR 1232, which is the Stop Militarizing Law Enforcement Act, um, put forward by Representative Hank Johnson from Georgia, that would prohibit the transfer of some of the most dangerous military weapons from the federal government to state and local law enforcement? I'm sorry, what the question was? So would you, support support, would you support the bill yeah. to stop the militarization of the police? <laughs> Excellent. Would you support legislation that allows the Department of Justice to step in if police kill citizens instead of leaving it up to local or state sure. district attorneys? It's happening now. Yeah. Would you support legislation that offers free public education to all citizens? Would you support legislation that supports after school programs because the current administration says that they do not um, help <laughs> P students get better? Would you support after school programs? Excellent. Would you be willing to incentivize schools for LGBT sex education? Um, staffers in Washington are not as diverse in other mar as compared to other markets. Would you commit to having a measurably diverse staff in, in Washington? 
All right. HR 40 is the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans studying reparations for the slavery and for, um, for segregation. It's looking into the feasibility of offering um, reparations to that community group. Is that a bill that you would support? You can also say the expand if you want to expand. I would just say I'd like to read the bill first. Yeah. But conceptually, yes. Okay, cool. And then um, the last two are, would you support HR 2840, which is the automatic enrollment for voter registration that everyone's automatically enrolled? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It, it would save me Sundays because I'm out there registering Absolutely. voters. <laughs> so thanks for that. And then also, would you guys support legislation to make federal um, voting a federal holiday? Yep. Yes, definitely. Fantastic. Even if you do it by mail. <laughs> All right. So here we go with the questions. I'm going to ask both of you guys this question. You will have 60 seconds to respond. I will be starting with Mr. Ruda. The question is, there are an estimated 554,000 homeless people in the United States. Of that total, 193,000 people have no access to nightly shelter and instead are staying in vehicles, tents, and the streets and other places considered uninhabitable. What would you do in Congress to address the homelessness in the United States? This is an issue that's near and dear to my wife and I who's sitting there. In our 20s, we started a homeless shelter for, uh, for families. And, and the issue that we addressed 30 years ago is still there today. And that is uh, families, they, they, you, you lose the job, you lose the house, you live in a motel, you run out of money, you live in your car, and then you make the decision to go to a shelter. And even today, many of these shelters divide the people up in, in, with the women and younger children often going to the women's shelter and the men and older boys going to the men's shelter. The, it, it, or living on the streets, which is even worse. Uh, the issue has to be addressed to provide adequate care and work these folks back into society. Contrary to what Dana Warbacher said, this is not a life lifestyle decision by people who are homeless. It is just the opposite. So we need to provide an opportunity to get them back on their feet, give them stability, get them into abated housing, subsidized housing, and back into the workforce with appropriate medical uh, care all along the way. And I can expand on that more later. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Dr. Kirstead, do you have anything that you would do in Congress um, additionally, differently, to help solve homelessness in the United States, which, as I said, um, last year was estimated to be 50, 554,000 people? Cer certainly would. You know, I, I took my little boy, uh, eight years old, down to uh, the riverbed, and it was one of the most memorable experiences I'll ever have in him asking me questions for weeks afterwards. Uh, why do they choose to live that way? How come we're not helping them all and having them stay in our house? How come the city hall doesn't do anything? And are they all crazy? What's different about poor people? You know, from the mouth of babes, it was just an extraordinary experience for me. I, I joined uh, a leadership council of United Way that's joined my campaign. Uh, United Way, I mean to say, has. And I've, I've really thought a lot about this. As a congressman, to specifically answer your question, what we can do is um, support HUD and bring infrastructure and stand up beside our local officials because it is a local issue. But I'd, I'm also investigating a bill that uh, ties homelessness, or sorry, the um, uh, care centers in locally for a drug that put a lot of them on Thank to human trafficking. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you each 30 seconds to follow up on that because I, I want to make sure that it's clear. Um, Mr. Ruda, you are saying that you're going to support existing things that exist. So it, um, supporting infrastructure, supporting health care. Is there anything, is there a change, is there innovation here, or is it that we oh, there, just need to do what we do lot. better? There's a lot that needs to be done. But just to clarify, and please don't hold me time to this because this is clarification on yep. Aaron. You said 5,550,000. 5, I think you were talking Orange County and the state of California in those numbers, correct? That was the United States estimated numbers. However, that's always that's, going to be, no, the problem is, is that's always going to be lower because... I mean, it's always going to be too low, right? The right. thing is, is that there are many more homeless people, but that was, according to the U.S. Census data, their most accurate guess. So, so there's three, yeah. three things, to answer your question, three things that need to be done. We have local dollars available right here in Orange County that are being held up by the Republican County Supervisors. Second, we have a state in the, in, in, in the legislature in Sacramento has to address the homelessness issue across this state in a much more concerted effort. And third, the federal government needs to do their part, and you need to have a congressman who's willing to bring those federal dollars back here to address this issue. 
All three of those need to work in concert with, with local leaders and municipal leaders, elected leaders, religious leaders, to, and business leaders to make sure that we have a holistic plan to address what I talked about earlier. Fantastic. And then Dr. Kirstead, to solidify what you were saying, it's going to involve more research as well, and then also um, implementing um, the already establishing structures, or is there another piece that we weren't clear on? Yeah, The so um, to be clear, the you asked the question about nationally. Yep, what, what that's I, what, correct. What would I be doing? Yeah. And the substance abuse centers that are proliferating, that are dumping a lot of homelessness onto the streets, homeless onto the streets, I'd like to tie that nationally to human, human trafficking bill in order to properly regulate that. All right. Um, so now the next question for you guys, um, you're going to get 60 seconds each, and we're going to start with Dr. Kirstead. The question is, according to the ACLU, one in 110 adults, so that's nearly 1% um, of the American population, are incarcerated in prison or the local jail in the United States. Additionally, one in 35 adults come under some form of correctional control that includes parole um, and probation populations. This marks the highest rate of imprisonment in the American history. What is the purpose of prison? And does our current prison system actually achieve that goal? You know, we have just less than 5% of the world's population, but we have almost 25% of the world's jails. And there's something extraordinarily wrong with that figure. Um, we have to, um, like, what is incarceration? It is um, a system that is becoming more and more privatized and our, our legal justice system is more and more compromised, putting more people into it. So we have to do away with things like 109, 47, and 57 that are dumping uh, people onto our local county jails and systems where we don't have the jails or the individuals in order to care for them. We need to revise minimum sentencing and we need to basically stop people, stop this, this, uh, this state from pouring more money into incarceration than it does higher education. Fantastic. Mr. Ruda, um, same question to you. What is the purpose of prison? Are we actually achieving it? And is there anything that you feel that you can do as a congressman to um, affect change? Well, the, the purpose of prison is to uh, punish and rehabilitate. And and we seem to do the first part very well and the second part very poorly. And while we do represent 4.5% of the world's population, it's not 25% of the prisons, it's actually 25% of the world's prisoners. And of those prisoners we have in the United States, approximately 60% of them are African American and Latinos. And we have a corrupt system that causes a greater uh, number of minorities going into prison. When you have for-profit prisons and you have judges receiving uh, uh, contributions to support their re-election from the very prisons that benefit by heavier sentencing, you have a corrupt system. And it has to be addressed. And I would certainly fight as hard as I could in Congress to make sure we did that. Finally, since I still have some time left here, we have to make sure when people come out of prison, they're not le leaving with what they came in with. They have to have an opportunity for vocational skills, employment, and ability to land on their feet. Uh, and also, they should be allowed to vote. They paid their price to society. Fantastic. The next question is to uh, Mr. Ruda. The Sixth Amendment gives indigent defendants the right to government-appointed counsel in criminal proceedings. According to the Department of Justice, however, between 60 and 90% of criminal defendants qualify as indigent and need a public defender, yet public defender's offices, both in states and federal system, are notoriously underfunded, resulting in a system where 95% of criminal cases end up in plea bargains, in part because public defenders do not have the resources um, to take on these cases to trial. Um, this means that people of color often do not have access to effective counsel. What are legislative solutions to this problem on the federal level? We need to make sure we have appropriate funding in place to make sure that everybody has a fair trial. And, and Aaron, you hit the nail on the head. They're, they're underfunded, overworked, and in some cases, maybe not that great at their job in providing the appropriate uh, uh, service to their clients. So through funding, through education, and making sure that also the court system is better equipped and uh, in a position to make sure that they're being processed in a, in, a, in a routine way that doesn't keep them in jail for excessive periods of time, 
and, and working through those types of situations has to be done not just at the uh, local level and the state level, but also through the AG's office of the federal government. Quick follow-up, though. Is, is this the place of the federal government to step in and hold states accountable? If that state is showing consistently failing to provide adequate representation or not providing adequate representation in a timely manner, the federal government should have the ability to step in and demand that appropriate resources and or training be provided so that those issues are addressed. Dr. Kirstead, you have 30 seconds um, to rebut on that. Is there anything that you feel would be different on these solutions to deal with the fact that 95% um, of people um, in these cases are ending up with plea deals and not being represented correctly? Yeah, well, there's a racial uh, segregation amongst them. So I think nationally what we could do is address that because that is a national issue. So if you, if you have um, you know, inadequate training, it, that training has to extend into racial inequalities and uh, um, incarceration, et cetera, that is also showing great inequality with uh, racial segregation. Fantastic, that's excellent. Um, the next question is to Dr. Kirstead. Um, we're going to be shifting over to cannabis. Now, cannabis has been legalized for recreational use in 10 states, including California. Recently, Chuck Schumer announced plans to submit a bill for the federal decriminalization of cannabis, despite Attorney Jeff Sessions' war on drugs stance on, on cannabis. For decades, the war on drugs, and spe uh, specifically cannabis, disproportionately targets African Americans and has had an institutionally racist effect. For example, according to The Guardian, while African Americans comprise one-tenth of Los Angeles' population, from 2000 to 2017, from the year 20, 2000 to 2017, they accounted for 40% of cannabis arrests. So my first question to you is, what are your thoughts on decriminalizing cannabis for medical and or recreational use? And secondly, how do we address the fact that if cannabis is federally legalized or proactively decriminalized, people of color are still sitting in jail for those crimes? Well, very, very well said. You know, I, I am in support of uh, national decriminalization of marijuana. Um, it must, as a number one priority, even before that, we've got to move it off of a schedule one because that is the reason why most people are going to jail. So first we do a schedule one, then we uh, like remove it from schedule one, then we get, we get that thing decriminalized. So we stop pouring people into our jail systems and ruining their lives with records with the, with, that prevent them from getting jobs. We need a whole lot more money to go towards research on marijuana for its medical purposes. I have been a professor at the University of California, Irvine, and I had Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient in marijuana. I couldn't even do the research, but for all those regulations that we had because it, because it was a Schedule One drug. We also need to allow businesses to exist without uncertainty that they do now. So we need to not only decriminalize it, but we need to properly regulate it so they know how to act so they can employ people. When it comes to the businesses you mentioned, and we'll get to you in the follow-up in 30 seconds, but I wanted to mention the businesses where there is actually an effect of gentrification going on because the people who are sitting in the jails arrested for a marijuana distribution are now not able to open up those dispensaries. So is there a form of restorative justice that you would put in legislatively to address this effect, this racist effect? Yeah, you know, on? that's a very good point. Restorative justice um, uh, mechanisms have worked before, so we could certainly do that again in this particular case. There is a very, there is great inequality in this system. Absolutely. You know, arrest rates, I, I don't know what the figure is, but the arrest rates are much, much higher. I think it's one to four, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we could go retroactive and actually restore that. The, the businesses themselves in, in both supply, believe it or not, water and land individually, distribution as well, are basically, the reg way regulations are right now, it's becoming the job of the wealthy. That needs to be flipped. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Ruda, um, you have 30 seconds to say how you would address the problem differently. Good well, luck. I, I just think the world would be a better place if Jeff Sessions would get high. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, is that on the record? That, that is on the record. It's on the record. Bring him to California, we'll give him his uh, medical marijuana card. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the bill that Schumer signed on to, which is a bipartisan bill, is a step in the right direction, but it's about nine steps too short. 
And it has, it's basically reducing sentences. Many of these sentences, as you're alluding to, Aaron, just need to be removed. And these people need to be brought back into society with a clean record. You know, possession of marijuana and serving time, uh, non-felon, uh, non-felony uh, convictions based on uh, possession or small amounts of dealing, three strikes and you're out, the stupidest idea that uh, we've put in place in a long time in our country. Uh, all of these need to be addressed. And again, that bill doesn't go far enough. That's time. Thank you very much. Mr. Ruta, the question for you is, according to the Center for Disease Control, in the 12-month period from April 2016 to April 2017, an estimated 66,737 people died due to opioid overdose, with veterans being twice as likely to die from opioid overdose due to chronic pain than the general population. For context, about 65,000 Americans died in Vietnam. Um, so that's 66,000 people dying of opioid um, overdose and 65,000 people dying in the three wars combined, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The current administration and the media have made the opioid epidemic center stage as a key issue plaguing American life. What is Congress's role in addressing this issue? And will the approach by the current administration by treating it as a public health issue be effective in the long run. Let's point out how nice it is that the CDC can actually investigate this unlike gun violence. And the fact they're doing it is great. The reality is, yes, over 50,000 people have lost their lives annually due to the opioid crisis. It is the number one killer of people under the age of 50. And in my opinion, there's a lot of people that should be held accountable for that, including the drug manufacturers that have been putting it into the market and, and the advertising and continued sales job to doctors to prescribe it, and the failure to provide adequate uh, help for these individuals that become addicted. And now, all that being said, you also have to recognize part of the driver of this, as we all know in this, is the fact that we have uh, decimated middle-class jobs in the United States through a variety of different means, whether it's uh, trade agreements or otherwise. And if people have no hope, they fall into temptation and addiction. And that has to be addressed as part of the overall uh, methodology here to make sure that addiction is, is reduced from where it is now. Uh, Mr. Kirsted, you had 30 seconds. You want thank, to thank you very much. Um, last week, I was in Las Vegas twice to give talks to the Opiate Mass Tort, largest coming together of uh, uh, lawyers in the world for the pu purposes of the uh, opiate crisis in the United States. And I'm playing a leading role in uh, gathering experts for that as a neuroscientist. $78.5 billion lost annually to this horrible disease of, uh, or epidemic. And it is a perfect correlation of deregulation that has allowed unlimited production and unlimited distribution. Alex Azar has to go. That's time. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kirsten, I did have, I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Ruda, I had 30 seconds because I had a follow-up question that I wanted to ask you was, do you feel like there is a different approach by the federal government in addressing the opioid crisis compared to the war on drugs or the ongoing HIV crisis? And which strategy should Congress approach um, these issues with? Well, I think you're getting to the inherent biasness, prejudices in how we address uh, drug overuse in the United States. And, and you're right, opioids tend to be a white person's addiction. And uh, case in point two, we've seen with the, the penalties for cocaine use versus crack use, cocaine use I believe was about one one hundredth of what, a uh, hundred times more coke to get the same sentencing as crack. And that needs to be addressed by having consistency across the, uh, the, the different drugs. The different penalties have to be the same and we need to enforce it consistently. That's time. All right, so the next question for um, Dr. Kirstead. When it comes to voting security, do you believe that our greatest threat is foreign hacking or domestic voter fraud or other issues? What are solutions you propose to make our voting safe in 2020? And Yeah, and then I have a follow-up for you, but go with that one first. <laughs> Yeah, as we've moved more towards electronic record systems, certainly cybersecurity and hacking is the, the number one national security threat. It's, it's nice to say it is Trump. It is actually cybersecurity threats. Um, and the same thing applies to our, our voting systems. I would actually, I'm a proponent of actually moving away to closed systems. Um, nuclear power plants get hacked because they're on an open system. 
we need to move to closed systems for our voter registrations and voting. How would you differentiate between legitimate voter fraud um, from attempt and also f how would you legitimate? How would you differentiate? Okay, let's try that again. How would you differentiate legitimate voter fraud from attempts to disenfranchise voters through um, like gerrymandering, et cetera? Like, how would you in your system? address those two problems? Well, certainly gerrymandering is, a, is a, a, an individual thing that can be grappled with. Cyber hacking is another one. Um, Facebook uh, blasts, influencing communities is yet another one. And then actual voter fraud is yet another one. So they should be regulated completely independently because we can, and it gives us much more acuity to stop this type of fraud and instigate a system where best winner truly wins. Uh, Mr. Ruda, did you, you have 30 seconds if you wanted to address There's this. virtually no example of voter fraud in our country. That's a fact. And Trump is just full of it when he puts that out there as, <laughs> as affecting elections. Now, cyber attacks to our voting systems, that is a concern and we need to fight to make sure that doesn't happen. But I think what's more important that you're bringing up is making sure that everybody has the ability to cast a vote. There ought to be automatic registration at 18 years old. It ought to be a national holiday to be able to vote. You ought to be set up for uh, mail-in ballots. We must make it uh, eliminate gerrymandering, and frankly, California's done a pretty good job in that area. We got time. All right, and actually, other ideas too, yet to come. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question for you, Mr. Ruda. In 2014, a researcher collected data on 27,000, sorry, 270,000 Facebook users who took a survey that he administrated. The problem is that he also took data from his friend, from the friends of those survey respondents without their knowledge. When he then passed all that survey information to Cambridge Analytica, that basically meant that he passed the information of 50 million profiles. So the question is, is that until now we've let private companies create their own data policies. Is there cause for congressional oversight and federal enforcement in data policies? Oh, gosh, yes. We desperately need oversight for these companies. Uh, in some ways, we're in a situation much like the, uh, uh, the late 1920s, where you have major corporations having undue influence in new industries. And uh, the, you know, these companies, you know, Facebook being the, the lead company, certainly need more government oversight and regulation. In addition, I think we need to look at breaking up some of these companies that have become so large and so invasive into our privacy. And finally, we need to recognize they're a lot like media companies, and they should be held to the same standards as media companies in, in many regards. So I will fight on, on the Hill to make sure we address these issues. And then the follow-up to that, though, is that Facebook would say that that is actually limiting their creativity, it's li limiting their innovation, those kinds of structures. It makes it more expensive for businesses to use Facebook and more difficult for Facebook to be more effective for its audience. What would you say to that um, critique? Yeah, I'm sure Exxon says it's probably harder to pump oil and, and burn fossil fuels because of the regulations we have on them. But guess what? We came to the conclusion that was a pretty good idea. And Facebook's the same thing. So you know what? They're making billions and billions of dollars. It's a huge company, and they can afford to do what is right to make sure the right policies are in place and following go appropriate government regulation. And if they fail to do that, then we need to look at taking additional actions, including fines. Dr. Kier said 30 seconds. Is it the place of the federal government to put um, regulations over the data cr creation and management of private companies? Yes. You know, we have to stimulate uh, growth of small companies because that small companies, the innovation of America is where the jobs come from. That's where my head is at. It's for the poor, the working class that need jobs in order to have a, you know, a distinguished living, in order to have a respectable living. We need to allow the freedom in that environment, watch the taxes on that group. But then when those companies are actually out there working, that's the time that we have to then regulate those things and with an increasing amount of oversight. So absolutely those companies need to be accountable. Excellent. So the next question is to Dr. Kirstead. With an epidemic of mass shootings on the rise and an administration that has followed policy views of the NRA, our children remain vulnerable to mass school shootings. Before we move on to questions about gun reform, I want to first ask you, what legislative solutions do you have to keep our schools safe from mass shootings? Well, 
you know, I don't think we should be arming teachers. <laughs> like, wh who came up with that? It's so absurd. Um, it's education. It's both education of the local police force and training. It's also training of the individuals as well. You know, I'm holding a town hall this Wednesday, and I hope you can all come, where I have a congressman who was shot. And we are holding a uh, town hall on gun violence. And please, please come to it. You'll, you'll just really appreciate how fast it was from the time that he heard the first bullet to when 17 people fell. How quick it was. If somebody with a gun was there, it would have done no good, he will tell you. So please come and hear this. But in, in schools, no, we don't need to be equipping people with arms. We need to be equipping them with procedure and policy and training. All right. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Harley, that's different? Because I have a question on guns for you, so we can use that time to get through it. Or if there's something specifically to keep schools safe, um, despite gun legislation, is there something like, is it arming teachers? Is it clear backpacks? Is it bunkers? What, what keeps our schools safe? We need to address the mental illness issues that we have in society. And in addition, where I think we're going to get into specific gun law discussion. Yeah. yeah. But I'm going to also push back on the mental illness thing because most mentally ill people are not committing violent crimes and shooting people. There's actually something else underlying there. So what is keeping the school safe? Because people are on, have mental health issues and they're not outgoing and doing these shootings daily. There's something else going on. How do we keep our school safe and address that issue? Aaron, personally, I think somebody in Vegas who opens up and shoots 500 people has mental challenges. All right, that's good. The question for you on gun legislation is, there are 33,000 deaths per year, um, gun deaths per year. What gun reform measures would you support in Congress to address the gun epidemic? Um, so what works? Is it banning bump stocks? Is it stronger background checks? What is, like, on a gambit, you have a minute, what are you willing to do to fight for to um, address this gun control issue? Me first? Yes, yes. California's got a great model. California requires 10-day waiting periods. It requires all uh, guns to be licensed and permitted. It has banned... Uh, bump stocks, it's banned, automatic rifles, it, assault weapons, excuse me, high capacity magazines, uh, people on the no-fly list from being able to purchase guns, and those who have been documented by a court of law to be uh, mentally challenged not to be able to buy guns. So that's great, right? But it's only good if the rest of the states have similar laws, which is why we need federal laws that support this. And it's also why virtually every one of those topics I just said, those action items we could take, including raising the age to 21, every one of those has almost universal majority support from both Republicans and Democrats around the country. So this is not a red-blue discussion. We have the support we need, we, and we should thank these Parkland kids for bringing this front and center. Excellent. 30 seconds, um, Dr. Kirsten. Yeah, very specifically, uh, Congressman should be doing the following. The Brady Handgun Violence uh, Protection Act needs to be supported. This is a bill that stops loopholes and expands background checks. In, so all of the things we're talking about with those things, they, they are very, very important and they're well encapsulated. Also, the protection of lawful commerce um, uh, of arms acts needs to be obliterated. This is an act that provides immunity to gun makers. It is ridiculous. It is the biggest loophole. It needs to be repealed. And lastly, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives needs to be backed up and supported. They can't even fine groups that are breaking Time. the law for distribution of guns. But actually, we're going into loopholes and shields, so that's actually really Good. great, Dr. Kirsten. <laughs> so um, I want to just give the preface. Um, Tamir Rice, Raika Boyd, Michael Brown, Kimberly Crenshaw, Eric Gardner, Tanisha Anderson, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland. It's a list of names that only cover a small subsection of the ever-growing list of names of black people who have been killed by police officers. In these cases, officers have not been convicted of any crimes, with a majority of them not even being charged, due to the DA not bringing charges or judges following a precedent of qualified immunity for police officers in civil and criminal cases. Right. The question is, um, what will you do in Congress to ensure that justice is served in these communities? Well, there's a very, very specific thing that can be done to, dis to answer your question that is requiring the Department of Justice to investigate all 
violence and instances where police officers are involved with, with uh, beatings or death. Every single one. That is not done at present. And we must insist that the Department of Justice does this. Excellent. And then, um, Harley, I want to give you the same 60 seconds to actually just address that in the sense that these communities are, you know, they're facing police violence. And then the police officers, even though they are making what is called a mistake of justice, are then not tried. Um, what is the solution as a congressman that we can do to address this problem? We had uh, around 1,200 people killed by the police last year in 2017. About one quarter of them were African Americans and about 30% of them were unarmed. And there's a, several things that go into what causes that, but the militarization of our police departments is one of the things that helps elevate this greater sense of uh, we're not peace officers, but we're actually military units that have to uh, act like soldiers in the field. Uh, second is the predictive policing that goes on. And predictive policing is algorithms that suggest where you need to be because of based on past uh, data that suggests crimes occur in these neighborhoods. But that data is based on the biases that are built into the previous actions. So you're, you're kind of extend, extending and accentuating the issues that you're trying to address. So uh, I would suggest that predictive policing needs to be very transparent and challenged as to how it's being used because I think it's causing some of the additional problems. Time. Um, Mr. Ruda, from Virginia to Washington State, lawmakers in at least 18 states have introduced or voted on legislation to curb mass protests or removing the liability for harm caused to protesters in um, what civil liberties experts are calling an attack on protest rights. What would you do as a congressperson to ensure that people participating in the resistance um, or through actions of activism do not have their constitutional rights violated? This is a little personal to me because um, you know I go out every Tuesday and protest. So. Yeah, and, and personal to me too. I, I protest as well. And uh, uh, whether it's uh, protesting or marching, it's our constitutional right to assemble. And I would fight to make sure that we maintain that constitutional right. And frankly, these states that are trying to pass these laws, personally, I don't think they'll, they'll survive. So is there a bill that needs to be passed in Congress to supersede that? That's the question, right? So I mean, like, because they are trying to attack on a state's right level. So is there a bill that needs to be right, written federally? I'm to not, hold them accountable. I would say the federal bill only needs to be written if the court system fails to do its job. So you know, that's the nice thing with our government and the three branches. You, know, you don't have to provide legislation for every single thing when we have a judicial uh, system that can challenge whether it even has the right to exist. So let, if those laws pass, and let's hope they don't, and if the ju judicial system fails to knock them down, shut them down, and reverse them, then yes, I would agree the next step is looking at taking legislative action at the federal level. Um, Dr. Kirstead, I have a question for you. We're gonna try to get through these because I have two more and then you guys have closing statements and then everyone's gotta go home. So, <laughs> so here we go. The question is, um, in 2015, President Obama called for an end to conversion therapy and the American Psychological Association called for the end to the practice as well. The EPA president, Barry Anton, um, said, so-called reparative therapies are aimed at fixing something that is not a mental illness and therefore does not require therapy. There is insufficient scientific evidence that reparative therapy to change people's sexual orientation works and they actually have the potential to harm the client. Um, that said, people across the country still fund and send their children to faith-based conversion therapy camps and retreats. What is your opinion on the religious faith, on religions and faith-based organizations being involved in medical treatment of children, for example, in, conven um, in conversion therapy? You have 60 seconds. Well, let's be clear. Conversion therapy, there's no scientific evidence that conversion therapy works. There isn't. There's no scientific there, the evidence. We have a huge industry that's grown out of it with absolutely no basis for that. On the contrary, we should not be spending money there. We should be spending money on education, freedom, helping schools and even grade schools starting to cater to behavioral norms like LGBTQ. Behavioral norms like equality amongst all individuals. We need to be funding and supporting this rather than an industry that has come up with an absolutely bogus justice or a, a justice system for putting conversion therapies out. It does not work. Um, Doctor, um, 
It's late. <laughs> Harley, you got 30 seconds. Dr. Root China. is okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is draconian. This is something that Hitler would have bought into in the Nazi regime. So what we need to make sure is that we impeach Trump just before the 2020 election so that Pence doesn't have any time to speak of in the White House because he's even scarier on this topic than Donald Trump. And, you know, and I want to point out, you know, about one out of every 2,000 births in the United States are, are the sex characteristics make it difficult to understand what sex that child is. And so to sit there and say that there is conversion therapy available, and there are so many other factors that go into how we, what gender we identify That's with. That's the time. That we will talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I have um, a question for each of you guys. You have 60 seconds to do it. Um, and then we are starting with Harley. And the Basically, the question is, what are your three no compromise issues? I know we have the discussion about where sometimes we might have to compromise in order to move something forward. What are three issues that you will not compromise on under any circumstances? Women's right to choose. Recognizing that climate change is real and we need to address it. And quit holding dreamers hostage. Let's provide them with a path towards citizenship. Dr. Kirstead, 60 seconds for the three um, no compromise issues that you will not I, you know, I've got a no compromise issue in that we need a Medicare for all system. Absolutely no compromise whatsoever. We also need a no, com I have a no compromise attitude towards the environment and moving towards a clean energy system, a 100% oil free future. Like California is doing right now, we need to follow that example and move it uh, throughout the United States. Do you know that our uh, leader of uh, energy was just here trying to get California to put 20% oil on our grid? We don't even burn oil on our energy grid. So, yeah, so that's, that would be the number um, two. two thing. And then the number three would be reversing Trump. Reversing him like getting him out of office, but reversing every single regulation and deregulation that that man has put into place. That's going to take two years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, you guys. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you guys for this experience. Before we go, you guys have the closing statements. We're gonna start with Dr. Kirstead and give the final word to um, Mr. Ruda. Okay, well, thank you all very, very much. You know, I, 90 I, seconds, I, sorry. Sure, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, my, I could tell you all how the campaign's doing great. We've had more endorsements um, since I received the California Democratic Party endorsement than, um, than we've had and anyone else has had. It's been wonderful to have a, a real coalescence of support. Our field work has, has tremendously expanded, uh, hundreds of fold. So we are hitting the ground several times a week and knocking on over 152,000 doors. So that's going extremely well. And it's, you know, I've, the national media attention is going fantastic. All of the polls, both internal and external, have me and Rohrbacher winning this primary. I'm extremely, extremely excited about it. But I want to leave you with something. I want to leave you with the thought that perhaps it might be good to have someone with a relevant field experience in the House of Representatives. We have a whole lot of individuals there with relative experience, field experience, that is duplicated, like over 70%, around 70% of the people there being lawyers. You need somebody that is a medical professional and a scientist at the table. It's not only your air and your water, it's not only your healthcare system. It's the soother you're putting in your child's mouth. It, you need someone at the table during trade negotiations that's saying, what are the degrading chemicals of that thing being imported? So please support me, join our campaign, put boots on the ground and phone, a phone on your ear and support Kirta for Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kirstead. Thank you. Mr. Ruda, final words, 90 seconds, make it count. We started this campaign about a year ago, and when I jumped in, I jumped in with one purpose, and that was to defeat Dana Rohrbacher. Didn't put my finger in the air to test polls or anything else, just knew we needed to be the change we wanted to see. And as we are here today, we have over 1,000 volunteers. We have tens of thousands of followers and donors. We have more endorsements from congressional members than any other campaign. We have more endorsements from labor uh, institutions than any other campaign. We have more endorsements from mayors in the district than any other campaign. 
and we have raised more money and have more cash on hand than any other person running, including Rohrbacher. We're in a great position to beat Rohrbacher. I know I can beat Rohrbacher in November, and yes, I have polling that shows I would beat him as well as independent polling. Ultimately, though, it's your decision. You are the ones that we really need. I need your votes to do this. I respectfully and humbly ask for your support because with your support, not only will I move to the general, we will get Rohrbacher out and we will create the blue wave from the California coast to the East Coast. Thank you. Thank you. Stay right there, guys. Can we give them one more round of applause, please? Good work. You both did a good job. I want to say thank you before we get ready to go. Um, one, thank you to our partners. Let's give a round of applause to Anthony for moderating the first part. Thanks to our partners, Equality California, Health Access, and then also the Laguna Beach and Newport Beach Independent. Um, before you guys leave, please fill out your surveys um, so that we can collect those and let know the straw poll. On top of that, we're doing the endorsement tonight. If you signed up for a ticket tonight, you should get an email. At 10 o'clock, the polls open for you to see who we're gonna endorse for Indivisible. I also wanna give a really huge thank you to Sarah and Lulu. Without them, we couldn't do this. And I wanna thank our volunteers and our speakers, Estrella, and also um, Kelsey. Kelsey. Jesus, I'm staring right at Kelsey and I don't remember Kelsey's name. Thank you. Thank you all, have a great night.